G'day guys, welcome back to another episode of the podcast and you don't want to miss out on this episode. You're going to want to listen to this episode the entire way through and not miss out a thing because I have on a very special guest, James Shramko. He's the owner of Superfast Business and he's the author of the book, Work Less, Make More. And essentially what he does is help businesses grow really quickly. I think it's something like half of his personal clients will make like $3 million a year. It is crazy. Anyway, me and James sort of go way back. We've had communications for the past couple of years and we finally decided to jump out, jump on a podcast episode together and it was amazing. I just could not recommend it anymore. Before we get started on the podcast, I just want to let you guys know that Eternum Labs Zone is what literally I take before every single podcast to get into the zone to make sure that I'm having really good conversations, that I'm thinking about everything and can and can bring my best self. And I use this for workflows. I use this before gym. It essentially has everything in it that you don't need to get with a coffee. (laughs) Essentially, it's got all the juice and all this stuff for your brain, for your brain to run off of so that you can perform at your peak for longer. It's amazing. So without any further... Oh, and if you want a discount on this, guys, you can use the code Corey on eternumlabs.com.au in order to get yourself some. And before we start, there's just a couple of extra things that I want to mention. If you guys are interested in any of the nutrition or diet or recipe stuff that I've got available, you can go on to coreyboutwell.com, head to the blog section and purchase the recipe ebook. You can also go on to the link in my bio in Instagram and get the recipe ebook there. I also offer, if you guys want, I created some accountability books that I use for my coaching practices just to keep you accountable. I've got like a whole spare bunch. If you want any, let me know, send me an email, I can get you some. And I also offer coaching services. If you guys don't know about those, obviously, you know, I'm a coach. I do a whole bunch of coaching. And if you guys want a consult call or you are interested in doing like a half day session or even jumping off for some coaching, I'm all ears and available for you to contact. Just head onto my website, coreyboutwell.com and you can apply to speak to me and we can go through, brainstorm, figure things out that, you know, could be in your absolute best interest to change your life for the better. So without any further ado, guys, please enjoy this podcast. It was one of the best podcasts ever. And I'm so grateful to have James on the show and we'll see you in the next one. G'day, James. Thanks so much for coming on to the show. Oh, this is very exciting, Corey. Yeah, it has been a long time coming. I've been following you on the socials. I've, I've read your books. I've, I think I originally found you on a Pat Flynn podcast and I was listening to, listening to it a few years ago in a time where I just developed like a hierarchy methodology that I started that I wanted to coach people on. But first I was like, I'm going to coach myself through this. And one of the things that I was focusing on was like one of the modules in there was finance. And the question that I like to ask for that is, do you live, do you make the income to live your most desired life? And when I was listening to your podcast and the, like the equation that you was talking about that you written in your book and how you really live your most desired life through setting all, all the things up through business and, and creating just like blew my mind. Yeah, it was, it's, it was important to me to build um, a business that could fund the life that I wanted to live. So it's, it's, there's not really a traditional way of thinking about it because the old way was, that was ingrained when I was coming through work was you, you leave school, you go to do some study, you get a job and then you work that job until you retire. Because when I, when I was going through school, there was no internet because I, I finished school in the 80s. And that, that just wasn't a path. If you're a young person now, you've got a completely different pathway available to you to skip a lot of the, the steps. And I would now classify what I do as living kind of like semi-retired. That might be the closest adaptation, but I think it comes under the category of lifestyle design. It's designing a life that you want to have on repeat, like a positive Groundhog Day and then setting up income streams to make that happen and deciding how much do you, you know, what do you actually want and how much are you prepared to pay to get that? Recognizing that there's often a big steep hill in front of the success path. It it probably like a bodybuilder would have to do an enormous amount of work to get to the point where they compete and win a contest to then be qualified to, to make a good living as an advisor or a coach to people having done that work then you can 
tail back a bit and start designing things. So there is that, uh, there is a transition phase. Yeah. And like, how did you do it? I was a general manager at the Mercedes Benz dealership and a lot of my clients had their own business. So I got the concept that I really needed my own business rather than to be an employee. I recognized there was a change happening with the way people were, were buying uh, with this internet thing. My parents had a travel business and customers started booking their own holidays. My customers were walking into the showroom knowing more about the models than we did from the manufacturer because they could research it online. And I thought this internet thing uh, combined with the idea of having my own business could be the pathway for me to, to not just focus on my local area with one product competing with uh, seven other people selling the exact same thing and then like 20 competitors in my nearby area selling uh, opposition. Maybe I could take my sales skills and my general management knowledge and have an online business and serve the world. So it was like the rough concept. And then I had this difficult phase of trying to figure out what that business would do. And, and it's as part of that struggle, like the most basic step of all, like how do I even build a web page? <laughs> uh, you know, that's that struggle also became my salvation because in the process of figuring that out, I realized a lot of other people are going to want to figure out how to build a website too. And I ended up finding a good solution that I was then able to recommend to other people as an affiliate. So I was effectively a salesperson for this brand or product, and they would send me a commission when someone would buy this product through my recommendation. And I scaled that up and that got me about a quarter of the way there. The, the next iteration was to make information products that complemented this product that helped people use the product better. So I created a guide, which I called a cheat sheet. And then I sold that as an information product. And I love this, this, the leverage in this, the idea that you could take knowledge, put it into a PDF document and then sell electrons effectively, an unlimited supply of electrons. They can sell to an unlimited market. Like my market was English speaking internet users who wanted to build websites and use this tool. And then, that got me halfway there. And then the next innovation was to say, hey, there's a lot of businesses out there who need a website and they don't have a clue about things like how to rank their website on Google or how to run advertisements on Google to get people to their website or how to collect email addresses on their website. So I set up a digital marketing agency and I sold websites and marketing services. Initially, I only had two clients and each of those clients paid $5,500 per month. And that got me the other half. So then I was able to quit my job. That whole process I just described in a few minutes took me two and a half years from scratch to being able to match my income as a general manager. And then I was out of there. And just for perspective, and I think this is important, whilst I was about the same age as probably your average listener, or maybe just a fraction older, I was, I was in my 30s, at this time, uh, I had four kids. So I had huge uh, financial burden. And also I live in Sydney and it might be hard to relate to if you're living in Adelaide, but uh, property prices and cost of living in Sydney is very high. And so I wasn't in a situation where perhaps a 20 something year old who lives at home and has no kids and no mortgage and no financial stress can relate to that. I think the the, the mental barrier of having to replace my income was my biggest challenge, but also the only reason I pushed through. And I think it's probably hard if you don't have those, uh, those forces pressuring you, you need to be very, very driven inside. And I, I imagine as an athlete, a disciplined athlete, you can relate to this, Corey, and probably some of your audience would, would relate to this. You've got to have that intense internal desire if you don't have an external motivation. Yeah. And that was like exactly what I was thinking about as you were discussing that is what sort of internal work did you have to do for yourself in order to overcome those challenges? Because as you said, it took two and a half years. I, I couldn't imagine the amount of struggle <laughs> and like things you had to overcome in order to, you know, get the lifestyle that you wanted. Yeah. And also for context, you know, this was the period between sort of 2000 and 
2006 and 2008. So back then, the internet was a little, you know, it was already 10 years old or, or however, however long, but there was a lack of information. There was a lack of tools and it was much harder to do things that we take for granted now. There were no Facebook groups. There was no YouTube when I started or it was, you know, very early days. So it, was, it was hard to put a video on a site. It was hard to build a site. These days, anyone can set up a Facebook page and, and a group in 10 minutes flat. So mental work, I guess it's, it's probably much the same as the process you might help someone go through to be ready to hop into an ice bath, which I know you do on a regular basis. If you take the average person off the street, they're not ready for that, uh, that acceptance of the inevitable pain that might come their way, unless they've been sort of into the popularized material like Wim Hof and, and so forth. Um, I, I had to educate myself mainly through books. I'd say books was my secret weapon through the uh, 90s. Uh, I, I've always consumed books. I started when I was about 12. I read a book on selling because it was one of the only books on a book stand in a Perth airport and I had a long flight to come back to Sydney by myself. And I read that book and I had no idea what selling was and I didn't understand most of what I was reading, but some of it got absorbed. And then later on, uh, because I wasn't a, a good student, I wasn't an academic type person. I had a short attention span, like, like many visionary business owners, you're probably going to encounter entrepreneurs uh, often change topics quickly and so forth. I discovered books, uh, especially when I got my, my start in selling. When I went into a career in selling, I just soaked up books. And then I sort of leapt from selling to sales management. And then I went broader. I'm like, okay, I want to learn about negotiation. I want to learn about body language. I want to learn about communication. I want to learn about law. I want to learn about commerce. And then I just expanded beyond that. Now I want to understand about Ericksonian hypnosis. And I want to <laughs> understand uh, about uh, all, the, all these other topics. I just went broad. Uh, so I've got quite a broad library. I'd say the absolute single best investment I've ever made was books, just building a library of books. And, and the secret is you have to read the book uh, and you have to implement the things you learn. Now, you don't have to read the whole book. I usually skim the title of contents. I look for the things that interest me and decide if I want to commit to certain aspects of the book. I might sample some of it. I might sort of skim through it a bit and cherry pick some bits to see if it really hooks me. And if it does, then I might read through it. But if it loses me at some point, I'll ditch the book and move on. And, and the other thing that's interesting about this is, you know, you've got to frame this with the fact that a book is just one person's opinion. It's their model of the world reflected. It's their learnings and understandings. So I always take everything I read with a grain of salt. There's no one Bible, so to speak. I mean, even if you want to use the Bible as an example, other religions have their own version of the Bible. There's, there's literally a Koran or, or um, a Book of Mormon or the, the a Dianetics book from the Scientologists and so forth. Everyone's got their own opinion or version of their truth. And I just extract and cherry pick and soak it up. And then I experiment. I take what I learn and, and put it into play. And that was critical for me through my management and leadership years and growing businesses is something I really fell in love with. And once I got onto those topics and discovered the original sources and, and dug deep into sales copywriting and business growth type topics, that was sort of my, my favorite thing to learn. And then I would implement it everywhere from my local dry cleaner through to a smash repairer. I would help them with their business and see the results and get encouraged by that and build confidence. So to answer your question, slowly over time, I invested in reprogramming my brain to be an effective machine to get results that I could then deploy to help other people. And as I did, I built confidence. So it's like banking into my self-esteem account. And over time, I started to believe that I'm actually good enough at this that I could charge people for it and make an income from it and be encouraged by the results they were getting. So it started small and, and it started with just that decision to educate myself and, and to reprogram the brain that had already been programmed predominantly by the time I'm six years old. And by 
my family and my environment, like the biggest mistake people make, and my friend Peter Shaw talks about this, is to believe that your beliefs are your beliefs. <laughs> They're not really. They were put there mostly by your parents and your environment. And it's only recently most people have discovered what white privilege we have. You know, if you're a white male in Australia speaking English in a, in a rich nation, you've got every advantage known to man. And you compare that, you know, if you start traveling and which you can't do at the moment, but when you could, I traveled around the world quite a few times in the last 10 years. And I learned so much about how my original thoughts, um, you know, were put there and, and what I thought was true and what I thought was real ended up uh, being questioned and changed over time. So I think if you're open to evolving, that's the step to building that self um skill that can fund your lifestyle yeah um i love that and especially you get so much like it would be so rewarding because you'd be getting such massive dopamine releases every time that you really learn something you've cultivated yourself and then you've taught taught it to someone else or you help someone else and then they've got massive results out of it i can see that it'd be so rewarding for you um at the same time i just want to like ask you is would you t tell us about a time that you had where you overcome some of your self beliefs, whether it would be traveling or something else, something when you were like, Oh, that's quite significant. And this is really going to change me going forwards. I've had lots of challenges <laughs> as we all do. Uh, and you know, if you look at a lot of people's Instagram curated accounts of their life, you'll, you'll see a lot of them are missing. <laughs> and then there's the oversharers, of course, who share absolutely every single challenge because they don't have enough self-love and they need other people to give them digital hugs, uh, which is, <laughs> you know, that's the extreme opposite. Yeah. I, I remember when I was, when I was selling my first sales job, I very quickly started going, well, it, I was so good at it. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I'm just talking factually within within months i shot to the top and and it was so quick that i questioned is this real because surely this is not possible or it's a mistake and and the one differentiator i had well, a significant differentiator was i was the one reading books you know i was reading my book before they opened up and then i'd implement that stuff straight away it just blew my mind that these professional salespeople I was competing with never ever read a book about selling. They didn't even know what selling was, let alone how to do it. Uh, and anyone who's ever tried to buy a car will have experienced a really shocking car salesperson. You know, <laughs> it's not hard to find bad practitioners. That's just an industry that attracts a lot of attention because everyone has to buy a car at some point. You know, we, we, we don't all deal with high level financial advisors and so forth until later on in life. And then we discover that every sales business has bad sales practitioners. So the challenge for me was I, I went really well, really quickly. Uh, within 12 months of starting, I was the number one salesperson in the whole of Australia for BMW and I was 23 years old. So it was, it was like, it's great. But then uh, I, I switched to Mercedes Benz and I had to start from scratch. And then it was like, okay, this is my challenge. Now I've got, I had one baby and uh, I, I switched to Mercedes Benz and I had to say, right, is this just luck? Is it the area I worked in? Is it uh, that the other people I was competing against were just so bad at what they do? Is it, um, you know, is, is it just, is it the geographic area? Is it the product? So I had to take away a lot of the variables and, and now a new product, a new geographic area, starting from scratch. I mean, I literally had to teach myself about the product. I was actually so biased towards BMW. My main question at interview was like, how do people hand on heart sell Mercedes Benz and feel good about it? <laughs> that kind of shocked them a bit. And, and But as I understood the product, I really fell in love with the product and I understood the product and I understood the buyer of the product, different buyer. Uh, than the BMW customer. And then, then within 12 months of joining Mercedes-Benz, I was the number one in Australia. So I was able to repeat it. And it was only at that point, so by now I'm like three years into it, and I actually accepted that I could actually be good at this, that I've removed enough doubt 
or concern or variables that it could possibly be true. And then I repeated the same thing as a sales manager a couple of times. But for me, it takes me quite a lot of validation to accept that this is true because I'm probably a little bit skeptical. And I think I'm skeptical because I was so gullible as a kid. I was easily led, uh, I was easily tricked. Um, an incident that happened to me when I was very young was I was playing with some neighbors out the front yard with my Lego collection, which I loved Lego and had lots of Lego. And my mum called me in for a sandwich or something and, and I went inside and then I came back out and we continued playing and something didn't feel quite right, but I couldn't put my finger on it anyway. About six years later, the kids across the road moved out and they said, hey, look, we want to confess to you. When you went inside, we stole your Lego. And they had a whole bunch of my Lego in an ice cream container that was mine, that was missing, but I never quite figured out why. And I think that that was an incident that deeply affected my trust in others and and started to make me more protective and and questioning things. So it's it's funny how our childhood can shape our future. and. That's part of the self work we have to do is we have to recognize that trauma and decide if we want to continue that pattern in the future or not. So uh, that that's a sort of an interesting segue, but I, I feel that um, even to this day, even as recently as today, when someone sends me an email and they tell me about a success they've had because of my podcast or my book or my coaching, I still screenshot it. I still screenshot it because if you run Facebook ads or you put yourself out there, it's only a matter of time until someone makes a nasty snide comment. They'll troll you or say something negative. Like I, I give away a book. I've got a book, right? It's called Work Less, Make More. And I give it away and I run Facebook ads. I give this book away, a digital version of my book, absolutely free. And I still get hated comments on that. <laughs> like, yeah, not as easy as it says, or sounds like communism. I, I don't know how they draw that metaphor. Um, or I bet he didn't even write it. <laughs> like, that one cracks me up because in the forward of that book is my writer who I asked to write the book, who tells the story of how that book came to be and that she wrote it. And she's listed on Amazon as a, as the author, as, as an author with me. Uh, so I don't understand that one. But anyway, so I collect these screenshots as my little self-esteem bank. If I, if I was ever unsure if I'm good at this or not, I can refer back to all the evidence that I have and prove to myself that it's okay. And then I can build that confidence up. And one of the recent emails I got was from a client who I had seven years ago. And he said, Hey, it's Terry here. I don't know if you remember me, but your advice cost me $600,000 and I'm and so I'm tentatively reading on. <laughs> All right. I do remember him. And I remember having really, you know, doing good work and, and having a good time. Anyway, he goes, uh, what you told me to do at the time was to buy out my business partner. And I had to pay him 600 grand. I'm like, okay, yeah, I would have said that. Because that's a really common scenario that I have. Because he had this business partner who wasn't pulling his weight and was just bogging him down and holding him back and having to wait for decisions and not being supportive of the future. So I said, just buy him out. And anyway, he goes on to say, I just sold my business to Microsoft for $22 million. <laughs> so what that means is he probably would have had to give $11 million of that to his business partner who he bought out for 600,000. So probably made him an extra 10.4 million. So you can bet I'm going to screenshot that. And I'm going to think about that. Uh, next time someone questions my advice or whatever, I know that I'm speaking from long term proven proof, like yeah. that's a seven year project that panned out well, as, as they often do. So how does that make you feel man? that's like miraculous. Uh, you know, when I tell that story to some other people, they're like, oh, he should send you a million dollars or whatever. And I'm like, what that makes what it makes me feel is tremendous um, joy for him. I actually empathize with how he might feel that he's put in the work. He's paid for guidance from me. He's done what I told him to do. He's when I say that, I mean, he's taken my advice and then made a decision on his own 
behalf to, to follow that advice. So that's an important distinction. He has got the results and he probably feels fantastic, right? He's like, he's done it. He's, he's lived the dream. He's crushed it. I, f I feel his joy. Um, I have absolutely no entitlement to a piece of that pie like other people. That's that, that's like the lottery mentality. I just don't understand that. Why would he send me a million dollars? I don't get it. He's already paid me for advice. That's his win. He owns it. He risked it. He earned it. So I just feel tremendous empathy for his fantastic result. I do feel personal satisfaction that I'm doing good work. And for me, I'm at the stage of life where I just want to do good work. And I imagine for you or for your peer group, it's when they, when they front up to the gymnasium and they put in a good workout and they feel good about that. Even if there was no one else there, even if it's three in the morning and they're doing a, uh, an ISO workout and they do good work, they could take personal satisfaction from that. This is not about everyone else, really. It's about, are you a good human? And do you feel like you're on the right path? So, yeah. And again, that's probably just an imprint of uh, like a Christian values or good upbringing or whatever. Is, is that why you started your business and started going through everything? Because you obviously had the goal of living a desired life that you had. And you no, I started that. my business because I wanted to make money. Yeah. I just want to make money. <laughs> I'm totally upfront about this. Yep. You know, when I was 20 years old, I met my wife. When I was 23, I was staring down the barrel of an impending baby. At 24, I had my first kid. I've got five kids now. I, I For that first 10 years of producing babies and uh, I just needed to get on the grindstone and make money. It was like survival. Just for perspective, uh, 20 years ago, an average house price in Sydney was around $750,000 20 years ago, right? Uh, so it was it was a grind. Oh, it was survival, man. I was like every single cent that I earned was already going back out. Uh, I had a mortgage to pay. I had food to put on the table. You know, it's not, and people, you know, I do get, I get negative comments about this sometimes when I talk about it. Oh, you know, why don't you live somewhere else? Or again, it's like you grow up there, your family's there. That's your home. It's where you want to live. You shouldn't have to feel bad about that. Uh, yes. I just saw someone in my social feed post, you know, what do you get from million dollars where you live? <laughs> and man, you can buy a five bedroom home, an absolute mansion on acreage in somewhere like Arizona. You can get a one bedroom studio in Manly, where I live for a million dollars today, like you'll get a tiny little place probably without parking. So I had a lot of pressure, I had a lot of pressure to perform. So I didn't start my business through any I, I, it wasn't about giving back or charity or doing good work at the time. And, and someone I've got, I've got a young guy, I coach, right? He's in his twenties. He's pulling 15 million bucks a year. And he said, it's interesting when you're young and you start out, your moral compass is quite wide. And as you get older, it seems to narrow in a bit because I'm, I'm sort of at my age and level in business, I'm helping these younger guys get to that stage a bit quicker. Well, I'm, I'm eliminating the potential for risk of them having blowback by doing things that aren't quite right. You know, they shouldn't be mislabeling their products or they should be testing the quality of their products if they're in e-commerce. They should be making sure they fulfill on all their promises and all this sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting. At the time, I just needed to make money, but I always went about it with values and ethics. So I discovered that just by looking after people, I could actually sell more than trying to rip people off, which was the <laughs> modus operandi of my peer group. The, the other guys in the car yard were like, which car pays the biggest commission and who can I stick this into? And that just horrified me as a human. It just didn't feel right. I'm like, what does this person actually need? And if they don't need anything we've got, then I don't think a sale should be made here. I'll tell them where they should be going. Yeah, I get that. But it wasn't just money as well. I'm guessing like at that time, it also would have been time. Like you would have been like, well, I, I, I want to make a lot of money so that I can have time. 
<laughs> well, at that time, you know, this is pre-internet. Uh, so for perspective, the goal back then is like you, you get, you level up as high as you can in the corporate job to get the biggest salary. And then you're going to retire at 65. That was the plan. Like when I started my first full-time job, it was 1991. My wage was 18,500 per year oh, woo. <laughs> and I was a debt collector, like, which is a good industry to be in when you're in a financial crisis, which we were in 1991, <laughs> debt collections, a hot zone. So uh, my goal at the time, like I had a friend who was making 27 grand a year and he was crushing it. And it's like, wow, I want to be, I want to be doing as well as him. So we work off our peers so we definitely play the comparison game when we're a young adult male. And, and, you know, this is what I do pick up from channels like your Instagram or whatever. They're, we're seeing a lot of stuff on our peer group channels. When you're a young male, it's all about strutting and flexing and being the, the man and being sexy to your potential partner. Like we're, we're wired for this. We just want to propagate. If you want to break it right down, and this is what a professor of anthropology told me, I, I sold a yellow SLK to a professor of anthropology. It was just like crazy cool dude and he said look we just want to get sex and propagate our genes and have have that dna move on and i read another saying that sort of summarizes this you don't have kids you're just producing these beings that will take on their own entity we're ultimately extraordinarily selfish so one of the things that motivates is, us is we want to be sexy to the other sex so that we that they'll want to have our kids so that we can propagate our DNA. It's just in us and wanting to get out. And that's at a core raw level. So, yeah, as a young man, I wanted to have a big income. I wanted to have nice things. I wanted to be the guy. I wanted to be attractive. Uh, you know, back then, like I did some modeling photos and I wanted to be in films. We have all these vanity things that I'm sure in your world are massive because that's it's just such an image driven business. And when you get past all of that, if you get past all of that, there's a whole other world out there. And I'm sure you've probably seen uh, guys like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? They go from the competition scene into things that they feel more interested in, like politics or, or whatever. And now he's teaching people not to eat meat and so forth, like whatever <laughs> they can move into their passion causes and, and evolve into whatever the next phase is, whether that's right or wrong. It's just, a, it's just, you know, the average male, I heard someone say, and I don't know if this is true. You probably do. They reckon they only mature when they're 42 years old. <laughs> and that's really interesting for me because of where I'm at now in the age curve, I'm really conscious of what I was like in my twenties and my thirties and my forties. I've just clipped 50. So I'm in a different zone now. And I can really see how my life has changed at those sort of marker points. And this is the good news. I'm super excited about where I'm at now. I'm actually feeling like I'm in a very good place. And this is, this is important for young people to know you'll make the bulk of your wealth when you're a bit older. So don't put so much pressure on yourself right now. It's not about crypto altcoins, right? It's not about drop shipping Amazon. These tosses, you know, the shirtless pictures on Lambos, flashing their blingy swagger. That is all bullshit and get past it. That's just superficial fluff. I coach some of these people and in the background, I can tell you it's carnage. <laughs> <laughs> they do big numbers. Some of them do a million dollars a month, but they also having a lot of struggles with how to actually stick it all to the road and make it all work behind the scenes. So I'm, I am, concerned whilst it's so easy to get into business there's a lot of peer pressure as soon as you can get off the comparison hamster wheel you'll never be someone else i can't be Corey, right he might like eating sardines out of the tin i might not <laughs> he might dipping into ice baths i might be too much of a wuss for that but i'll dip into icy cold surf to do my daily you know that's my equivalent so you do you i think someone says maybe gary v says that it's pretty important to not get caught up in the comparison. Just think about what's your race and where are you in terms of your journey and give yourself time. I, I wanted to stress this in 10 years is long enough to completely change absolutely every aspect of your life. You can have a different partner. You can have kids or not. You can have a different career 
job, different customers, different friends. You could live in a different place. You could speak a different language. Uh, you could be on a completely different food regime. Like 10 years is a really in, important sort of marker and be patient with it. Every 10 year clip I've gone through, I'm a completely different person. Like even the cells in our body change, what, every 30 days or something? You're yeah. not even the same person you were a month ago. So think about, give yourself time and space. Yeah. What would you say to you? First, I just want to say, I absolutely love that. Thank you for the motivation there and the wisdom that's like, uh, and it also like frees up a whole lot of space because I think being someone in their mid twenties, starting to approach thirties, you do, you put a lot of pressure on yourself, right? So I'm much sure pressure. You, so much pressure. And um, at one thing, it's super exciting, but the other time it's like, it's, it can be quite stressful. So if you were to give like yourself advice when you were in your mid twenties, like, what would you say? Well, I've got that scenario. You know, my oldest son is 25. So he's half my age now. He's the same age or a bit older than when I had him. So I do have that opportunity. Now he's found himself a role in sales. He's selling solar energy. This is the equivalent of what I was doing when I was his age. I was selling luxury vehicles in a boom market. He's selling solar energy in a boom market for energy. And I've sent him two or three books. So I've told him this is what worked for me. I sent him a book on selling, my favorite book on selling ever. What I've sent it? him a book on negotiation. And uh, I sent him one other book. I'll have to think what that was. Uh, I sent him a book about Steve Jobs. I sent him a book about Nike. And he's now reading them. And he understands so much more about it when he's reading it than, than what he thought he would because he actually already knew this stuff. I programmed him when he was a child. So my first advice is question your current software version. What software are you running in your necktop computer? That's not my expression, by the way. That's Professor Gleason Hewitt. Um, let's say your brain is a necktop computer. What software version are you running? Who put it there? And what would you like to change about it? You know, maybe you had a hard upbringing. You got smacked around by a parent or you, or one of them left the house or you had some horrible situation. I, I had bad things happen to me too. I had really, really good parents and a really good upbringing. I had a very, very bad uh, teacher. I had, I had bad things happen to me too. And you have to face that. Don't bury it or hide it or, uh, you know, no amount of ketamine or, <laughs> or uh, drinking or snorting or smoking or whatever is going to make that go away. Face it, take it head on, feel it, move past it, do the work and let it go. You know, just ac accept it. You can't change the past, but you can definitely change how you look at it. You can see what lessons were there. See who put that program in your brain and rewrite the software the way you want. And maybe this podcast is a part of that. If this, if this, podcast episode is a USB stick that you've plugged into your brain and given it a patch to fix some of the glitches, that would be a fantastic outcome. Mm. But you can continue on this journey. That's what I do. I'm, I'm constantly questioning everything. Someone even sent me a plaque. Question everything. Be yourself coach. You don't, you don't necessarily need other coaches for that mental work. Just ask yourself the questions, you know, is, is it healthy for me? to come home from work and sit on my couch and watch five hours of Netflix while I drink a <laughs> bottle of bourbon um, and flick around on other people's Instagram accounts feeling depressed about how shit my life is. Is that healthy or not? That's a simple question to ask. And instead of that, what else could I do? You know, could I go to the gym? Uh, could I ride an exercise bike? Could I do an ice bath? Should I listen to three more Corey episodes? Like, there's <laughs> yeah. a lot of things you could do. For me at that age, it was reading books. So to answer your question, to tell my young self, I would say, give yourself time, do good work, keep working on building the most valuable resource you have, which is that bit between your ears. That That is the greatest asset I've ever put my focus on. And it's my most, you know, it's like a laser beam that I can aim anywhere I want now. I just spoke to my accountant before our call. I was talking to him about another business model that I might be interested in. And we both agreed, like, if I set my mind to that and I want to do it, I could absolutely crush it. It only comes down to do I want to do it or not? Mm -hmm. That's that's the ultimate question. And 
I've now found a business model that works for me. So, you know, at my age, I'm still innovating and coming up with new things that work for me, taking advantage of my skills and experience, but doing them in an innovative way. Go and study the greats, especially people like Peter Drucker or Jay Abraham or Eli Goldratt or Milton Erickson uh, or any of the classic copywriters. Go and read up on them. Everything has already been done and invented and talked about, and it was all done 100 years ago. You know, there was even a pandemic 100 years ago. We can learn so much from what happened last time around and implement based on prior knowledge. Watch the movie Patton that, that came out in the 70s and won an Oscar award. He talks about how he used uh, Rommel's tank warfare guide to beat Rommel in tank warfare. <laughs> it's already there. Everything's already been published and printed and talked about. Just go and find it. Put aside some time to discover it. Yeah, I think that's really important is like literally putting like intentional time and putting some boundaries around actually feeding some good inputs into your brain. Because that's what I focus on with a lot of people like I coach and stuff. We just ask the question, as you were saying, it's just like, you know, where are your inputs? What are you, what are, what are constantly coming in? And do you have time in the day that you've, that you protect so you could actually get them in? And what yeah, do you it's like? That's like gar garbage in, garbage out, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's just, it's so similar. Like as what, the way your thoughts and mind work, is the same way that food works for digesting and nutrition. It's like you put in good, good food and nutrition. In, if you're in gonna your drink coke and eat a packet of chips, right? Could you expect your body to be falling in love with that? What's it going to? How's it going to react to that? Yeah. Exactly. And it's the same thing with the thoughts, as you're saying with books, it's like high quality, like nutritious content for your mind. So I love that. So one of the filters is, has the book been around for like 10 years? Is it a classic, you know, because there's a bit of a racket these days of people just publishing transcripts or slapping together a few blog posts and calling it a book. So look for the really good stuff. Yeah, to, to filter that out. Yeah, that's really good advice. What do you value now? Like in terms of because you sort of you've built up like from what I, I perceive as someone who's like, all right, I've wanted to make money. And then from making money, did that tick. The second thing you did was like, well, I want to really live life now and, and like live my most desired life and do all the things that I really want to do that make me feel really good. So like, what do you um, value now? And how do you bring energy to that? Um, above all, probably uh, my health, because without that, you got nothing. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, probably speaking your language here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm very conscious of aging and uh, making sure that I maintain mobility, that I have a strong immune system. How do you do uh, that, by the way? Just quickly, sorry to interrupt. <clears throat> I surf every single day. Right? Yeah, huge. And that's a good workout because I walk there barefoot. I'm mm. grounding to the earth and the beach and the water. I'm soaking in the, the salt water. Mm. I... Um, I, I mix it up a bit. I do different, I go different beaches and, and pathways. I ride different equipment to always challenge me so that it's never boring. I'm, and I'll take on any conditions from almost like ankle high through to oh, the biggest waves I've surfed now are about 11 or 12 feet tall. <laughs> so it's frightening. Yeah. And so my fitness, my, I've lowered my pulse dramatically. I've built up my muscles. Um, when I started surfing, I couldn't last 15 minutes. You know, and that was seven or eight years ago when I started. I was 42 years old when I started surfing. I'm 50 now. I can surf for three hours. I've got a resting pulse rate of like 52. <laughs> it used to be 78 when I was an office worker. Um, so I'm um, also my acuity, my, my awareness, my reflexes, everything's just gone up a notch. My hearing, uh, my, my, um, my uh, sort of sense of, of nature, everything. Like, I'm not exaggerating when I say I can walk down to the surf, glide into the water, see a bull stingray on the on the thing, watch a couple of dolphins, see a, a sunrise, glide into the waves that have come from thousands of kilometers from somewhere else, and just be at one. So I think that's for me. If I do that every day, I feel like that is that's my focal hub. If I ever make my business to the point where I can't surf every day, I have failed at life. Mm -hmm. That's that's how strongly. It's not something you do. It's who you become. 
and I know this is what you do with your thing, right? I see your Instagram pictures. If someone said you can no longer lift weights or go to the gym, you'd probably feel a bit disconnected. So <laughs> for sure. For me, surfing is the hub, um, and and that's closely connected with my uh, with a lot of things. It's kind of like a spirituality. It's kind of like uh, my health. It it also makes me a better person. I'm more patient. I'm calmer. It takes me a lot to lose my temper. I, I used to be very angry in my twenties and thirties because I had so much pressure, loaded up with caffeine, no sleep, had big angry bosses barking orders like physically assaulting me in some cases. It was so stressful and traumatic. Now I'm super chilled. People who know me now can't believe I'm the same person because we change. I've upgraded the software. Congrats. Uh, my baby two and a half year old girl is just like I spend every day with her and we we paint every day. We, we just do everything from uh, play going to the park she goes to the park twice a day this kid she's very active she's outdoors all the time she eats incredibly well she's growing up quickly uh, but that for me is uh, a massive thing time with her and my wife is is just huge and i'm still interested in money uh, but for for now it's like beyond the level of building the first layer of wealth and having a business that generates wealth where a lot of people don't think about but they need to get to is how do they take that wealth from the business and then invest that wealth to make put that money to work and make the money make the money so i'm interested in that so i spend a little bit of time on that as well on growing my money because i i would like to be able to not have to do a single thing that i don't want to do now i'm sort of in the zone where really have to be switched on and excited about something or i won't do it so i do say no to client work i do say no to projects i've switched off one level of my coaching that was a little bit more intensive uh, because i've found better business models i'm constantly innovating ways to achieve what i want and you know i'm at the point where i just want to do good work i want to feel good about what i do and i know it's not always going to be unicorns and rainbows and and you know gliding with ease but what i have discovered is through to you know because of adversity twice before you know in the in the early 90s and again in 2009 or whatever when there was a global financial crisis that's what we call it in australia they don't call it that overseas i have now built a pandemic resistant business that is flourishing and I'm helping other people do that too. So I, I feel like I'm in the zone. I'm in this sweet spot. We call it a purple patch, right? Again, other people don't know what that means, but it means everything's good right now. And for the first time in my life, I'm not having nightmares or waking up in a cold sweat or stressed about the future or worried about it. But I do see a lot of that happening around me and especially on social media. I've never seen such divisiveness or fear uh, or or toxicity as is happening now um, but frankly i'd already realized five years ago that facebook is a cesspool i was sick of it by then i think the rest of the population will get there maybe in another three years because they're typically on about a 10-year lag uh, for where i'm at because you know in 2020 was the first year that people realized they could actually do things on the internet like zoom or not go into an office but i already knew that in 2008 so I'm just going to continue innovating and being just a little bit ahead of the market and being counterintuitive because it's paid me well. You know, I used to like surfing during the week when there was no one there. But now that we're in lockdown, everybody's surfing during the week. <laughs> so I have to do something different again. Yeah, there is so much wisdom in what you said. And, th and thank you for saying that. I really want to um, reflect on one of the things that you mentioned was spending a lot of your own money on your own business. And that was one thing out of reading your book, Work Less, Make More, which sort of flicked in my mind was like, I have to spend, like it was hard for me to overcome, was I have to spend so much of my own money on my own business or nothing's going to happen. Like just in gear and stuff, whatever it is to-, to Can I speak action. to that? Yes, please. The reason that is, is because a, a lot of kids get a job, right? Um, maybe you work at the movies on the weekend or you work in a cafe or you, you get into retail hospitality, whatever we get paid, we get paid a wage and we don't really have expenses or obligations or responsibilities other than the thing that we're paid to do usually by the hour. 
So that's the way that's the way the software is programmed. I work this hour, I get this money, and that's profit, and that's it. When you're an entrepreneur, it's a different program. It's now you you can have your own responsibilities that you dial in. And I, I take that Superman saying, right? You know, with great response, with, yeah. with great res great um, power, power comes, comes great responsibility. Then it also must be true that with great responsibility comes great power. So if you want more power, whether it's financial power, time power, social clout, if you want to flex bigger, then take on more responsibility. So if you want to step away from employeeship and take on the responsibility of being a business owner, then the single biggest reason that's holding you back is you're not used to spending money because you never had to. So now you'll get paid before tax. Now you'll need to yes. reinvest in yourself to grow it. Yes. So let me ask you a simple question that demonstrates this. Would you, either, would you rather earn $100,000 a year with no expenses, or would you rather earn a million dollars a year with a $300,000 worth of expenses? It's a hard question. It's like really. you'd, you'd go with the no expenses, surely. <laughs> oh, so you'd rather a hundred thousand dollar profit as an employee than earning seven hundred thousand oh, dollars. No, no, yeah, owner? definitely seven hundred thousand dollars as a business owner. Yes, for sure. Right. Yeah. And also oh, because so, so you're true. spending three hundred thousand and buying labor, you're probably not doing as much as you had to oh, do for hundred. Yes. Yeah, I misinterpreted so, the question for a second then. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> you can yeah. edit that bit out if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got it or i should ask it a better way see me taking responsibility for asking it in a shit way <laughs> no. uh, what what it what it means is if you want to make more money the counterintuitive situation is you probably need to spend more money yes. i'm not talking about spend more to make more like that's so where were we, we just cut out for a second then <laughs> well, we're just talking about how as a business owner you're going to have to get comfortable spending more money than you've ever made in your life. Like yeah. instead of making a hundred thousand dollars, your goal might be to spend $300,000. If you have a good profit margin, let's say a 50% profit margin. If you spend $300,000, you'll earn $600,000. You spend a million dollars, you'll earn $2 million, right? So that's where you have to rewrite the software. Most people aren't comfortable spending big money. And I noticed this when I was teaching people how to sell Mercedes Benz, they weren't comfortable asking someone to spend $460,000 on a motor vehicle because they could never do it themselves. Mm. So you have to rewire, reprogram that. And, and the example that I have is the way I started my online business was I offered one of my clients who was a financial planner. You now he actually asked me, could I come and teach his financial planners how to sell? And I went to my boss and said, can I teach this customer, uh, can I teach his team how to sell? They're in a completely different industry. I don't think there's any, any compete. And my boss said, yes, do it, but charge a lot. <laughs> so, so I went home and I, 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 um, I basically uh, said, yes, I'll do it. And I, I planned it out. I invoiced this guy, I typed up invoice 001 I, I think it was $4,000 and sent it off and I booked some annual leave and I turned uh, and, and he paid me the invoice and I bought a laptop with it. I bought a Fujitsu laptop. I spent the whole four grand on my laptop. That laptop was what became my freedom machine. It was the one I built my, my first websites on. I used to roll out this like 10 foot cable and stick it into the phone socket for dial up. That's how old we're talking about. And I reinvested all of my income back into the business. I still had a job, so I could. And as I learned, you know, one of the mistakes I made in the beginning was I didn't spend enough. I didn't, I would try to find everything for free instead of spending $30 on an ebook, which didn't make sense since I used to buy books to learn how to sell. So by day, I knew this leverage and, and organization. And by night, I was back to, old thinking, you know, do this myself, make a big profit margin. So now in my business, I can generate seven figures of income and I can spend low six figures on expenses and have a wonderful business, very, very low, um, a, a low amount of effort because my team are doing a lot of the other stuff that I'm not. 
and they're in another country and I speak to them once a week and we have a great communication. We've been doing this for 10 years now and it works well. So that's the situation. You've got to get comfortable spending more as long as your business model can help you make a profit on top. And I'll give you a simple tip that's sort of a good guidance in personal wealth and business. Spend less than you earn. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. if most if most people did that, they wouldn't get into so much trouble. So true. So true. And one of the things that you said there, a little story that resonates with me is, you know, you spent $4,000 on a laptop was one of the reasons, I can't remember where I heard this from, but the reasons that Bill Gates made computers was to give people the power of an organization in their hands. So I think that's like... Uh, something really important. James, I just want to say like a massive thank you for coming on. Um, like a sincerely huge thank you for all the stuff that you do and like motivating and inspiring me. And like, thank you for being like brilliant. Like you're so sincerely brilliant. And um, yeah, I really look up to you with all the things that you do and, and, the, and the business that you do and the lifestyle that you live and the values and the morals that you have as well. I just want to ask one question before you go in terms of usually ask the question, like when someone gets to the, that point in their life where they're, had some sort of success or some financial success or business success, or they start to have some time success, whatever it is, is like, what would they, what should they invest in? But you've already answered that question. Like what's in between your ears, invest in that. So just to leave people with some practical tools, I was like, what real practical tools or tips or books do you think um, have had the biggest impact for you that people could get like this week, next week, or just take action on immediately after this podcast? The logical answer is my book. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm not saying that as like a shameless <laughs> self promoter, right? Like, I loved your book. Your work less right, but I've been in, but it, that book actually has had the biggest impact on my life because it opened, uh, it it forced me to strain my ideas into a book, which is hard to do because I had a lot of stuff. I've credited the people I've learned from in the book, so I referenced them, but it also helped me uh, to to think about uh, my business and it, it helps me attract the right sort of people. So having a book is a good thing, but if you're not at the point where you're ready to publish a book, then start learning and implementing so that you build up the experience to the point where you can. So I would say, think about what, what, if you already know the biggest gap that you have start there. And I'm sure you and I can put together some resources for that, but there are definitely old books, uh, that that teach really important topics that you should master. I think everyone should understand what selling is. I think uh, it's really worth paying attention to some of the the things on Ericksonian hypnosis because a lot of that's found its way into popular, uh, you know, modern day stuff. The the classic, of course, is Maxwell Maltz. Um, Psycho cybernetics was a fundamental resource for me. It teaches you the same stuff that it was really the foundation of things like visioning and uh, role play. You know, things that we take for granted now, they came from that book. It was a foundational book. What was and the, the grandmaster, of course, for business is Peter Drucker. Get into the Peter Drucker stuff. It's good stuff. He predicted what's happening now in the 60s. He was way ahead of his time. I was just writing those down. <laughs> Is there anything else that you'd recommend besides like, you know, publishing your own book or those uh, sort of reading those books? No, just learn and implement and, uh, you know, get in touch with us if you want to ask questions or, you you know, you, you want to find out what the next step is, just send an email or something. Yeah. And I, I also want to say, Corey, you've also inspired me. I learn from everyone around me. I watch your posts. I, I remember your video eating sardines talking about, um, do people still do the boring stuff, you know, like just eating their greens and grains or like what, what the old fitness coaches use, shift the paradigm on what's possible. You're talking about these, you know, rich foods that people can eat that are good for them, that have variety. I'm inspired by your ice baths and the discipline that that takes in sharing, uh, you know, the, the idea of immune system building and stuff. I learn from people like you and I'd love it if you come on my podcast and talk to my business audience about how they can improve their health yep. and uh, fitness and mental well-being and nutrition and so forth as well, because that is the core. Your business will ultimately be a reflection of you. So look after yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I'd absolutely be honored. And what you said is, is quite touching because uh, I, I focus so hard on trying to not just give advice to that, but embody it. 
and live it all day every day and uh, it comes thing. through it's yeah. a, you, you've got you have a phone in your pocket you can you can create and document content that's appealing to your correct audience like you've you've got the tools now and you're doing a great job with it and uh you know it's no doubt the reason that you're doing well you're a good person doing good things so that's a good formula that uh that is so obvious but seems a little bit rare these days yeah well thank you so much and if anyone would like to get in contact with you james after this podcast if they've got motivated and they're like yes we want to get into this stuff where can they find you uh they can email me james at superfastbusiness.com yep. uh, i reply to my own emails rare i know um <laughs> superfastbusiness.com has yep. got a lot of podcasts and Corey's going to be on there and uh my book work less make more you can buy it on amazon or you can listen to it on audible or you can get it for free if you want the pdf that's at superfastresults.com forward slash book uh but yeah it's great yeah. chatting and i've, I've it's good I, I love connecting with a fellow australian who's doing great things in in mm. the market and i appreciate what what that means for your audience as well mm. Thank you. And I appreciate you. And I, I really enjoyed this podcast. Like I got, I actually personally got so much out of this. So cool. a massive that's, thank you to you. That's terrific. Thank you. All right. We'll catch you later guys. See you in the next one.